live from the TV30 studio. Here is Jim Schneider. Well, good evening and welcome to In Focus. We're glad that you've joined us tonight for the broadcast, and we trust today's program is going to be rather intriguing for you as we talk about some very uh, important information, things that are going on behind the scenes that you may not even be made o know about. And so we will be talking about a number of things tonight as it pertains to, well, the Bible tells us that there's going to be another Jewish temple that is going to be constructed. Some think about that and said, how can that be? With the clash that's going on between uh, Israel and Muslim nations right now, how could such uh, a, a feat ever happen? Uh, but the Bible says it is going to happen. As a matter of fact, there are plans underway and preparations being made for worship in that temple. We'll be unfolding a number of things tonight on the broadcast in preparation for a series that is going to be launched right here on WVCY Channel 30 over the next few weeks on a program called In Grace. Uh, its host is with us tonight. We welcome Pastor Jim Scudder, Jr., pastor of Quentin Road Baptist Church in Lake Zurich, Illinois. He's an author, speaker on the program In Grace. It airs both on WVCY Television as well as VCY America Radio. Pastor Jim, good to have you here. Thanks, Jim. It's awesome to be here. I've known you for a while now mm -hmm. and uh, I really appreciate VCY and your ministry here, not only in Milwaukee, but across the country. Now in New York as well, I understand. Yes. Uh, the radio station went on there today. Well, we praise That's the Lord for exciting, that. Exciting, very and, exciting. And your ministry is going out through these outlets as well, which praise we're grateful for. Praise the Lord. Yes, amen. Yesterday, we're going to delve right into it. We've got a lot to unfold here tonight, but yesterday at your church, you had an Honor Israel Day. Tell us about that day, and, and why would you have such an event at your church? Um, we believe the Bible. The Bible is pretty clear that uh, if you bless the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God will bless, and we want that. We also know that uh, our Bible is Jewish, the authors are Jewish, Jesus is Jewish, so we feel like it is the thing to do to um, support them, love them, and, and help them in any way we can. So we had the Consul General to the Midwest come, and also, you know, uh, we had our people bring their Jewish friends. And so I gave a gospel using the Old Testament, the Hebrew prophets, and they, they heard about Jesus, Yeshua, so I felt like it was a win-win where we were able to proclaim Jesus and also uh, show our love and support for the Jewish people. Uh, one of our uh, young ladies sang Hatikva, which is their national anthem, Israeli's not beautiful song, The Hope, written a hundred years ago. And it just speaks to the longing for them to go back to the land. They're there, Jim. And that's why, I, I mean, I believe the Bible for so many reasons, but one is the modern day miracle of Israel it's, it, it, even if you didn't believe the Bible, you would still say this is a very amazing thing that's happened in history. Well, the Bible predicted it. So that's why we honor Israel. In the natural, Israel should not even exist today. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you've actually done several series on Israel through the In Grace program. Uh, you've done Discover, Discover Hidden Israel. You did a series on Armageddon's Dawn, dealing with end time, end time events, amazing discoveries of Israel. Why? Well, one, uh, our viewers love Israel. They love to learn about Israel. A lot of people can't go, and so we'll, we'll go for them and get to show them. Mm -hmm. I love Israel. I love going to Israel. I love talking about Israel. I love walking uh, through Israel. So uh, it's, it's kind of a win-win. I get to go. I get to film and, and learn stuff myself, but then I get to bring it to people that might not have a chance to go themselves. Would you address the issue of, uh, there are those who would believe that God's plan for Israel over and done with. Sure. They rejected the Messiah who came and they're put aside and that's the end. The church has now replaced Israel. Mm -hmm. You don't agree with that, do you? I don't. Um, you know, Paul and Romans, and he was the, the Jew's Jew, right? He had the lineage, he had the upbringing, he had the education, you know, everything. He hated Christians, he persecuted Christians as Saul, and then he saw Jesus and he mm -hmm. met Christ and he, he uh, was transformed into one that uh, wanted to tell the world about him. And he wrote to the Romans in Romans 9 through 11 that God is not done with the nation of Israel. There is a day when they will recognize Jesus mm -hmm. as the Messiah. And I feel like that day will be in, in the tribulation period and it will be at the um, ha about the halfway point of the tribulation period when the Antichrist will desecrate a rebuilt temple. Um, 
there are plenty of people even today that hold to replacement theology, which is the church has replaced Israel. Even the Vatican um, in, in the 20s and in, I think in the 60s s called Israel the, uh, well, they were like the old people of God and we're the new people of God mm -hmm. that, that the church has replaced Israel. Even Martin Luther, who was better in the beginning of his tenure in ministry in the Protestant Reformation, he supported Israel, but later on, he was really nasty in his writings against the Jewish people. So Protestants and Catholics both have gone against the Jew and against Israel, but the Bible, I think, clearly tells us that um, we shouldn't do that and that we should love them and support mm -hmm. them. And Paul wanted them, in, in, in Romans 9, he said, my heart's desire is for them to be saved. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so what are we to do as Christians today, evangelicals, well, we're to, to, to tell everybody about Jesus, but especially to the Jew. The Bible says to the Jew first. How can we share Jesus with the Jewish people? I say we love them. That's the key. Mm -hmm. If we love them, then they'll see. We are one of the only real friends of Israel, are evangelicals, and they know that, and they, they've recognized mm -hmm. that. And so I think we have, uh, we're making really good inroads today more than ever before as because we, we love them. And as we look into scriptures themselves, we see the term an everlasting covenant. Yes. Everlasting really does mean everlasting. And, uh, and unconditional, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, the Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. Right. The Davidic covenant, unconditional. It wasn't like if Israel did these things, I will do these things. God said, I will do these things. Mm -hmm. So uh, unconditional eternal covenants, it, from an, a, a God that's eternal and keeps his promise, uh, he's going to uh, use the nation of Israel again, but it'll be in the future. We are excited to have you here tonight, Pastor Jim, for the, uh, the, the launch or the, the promotion of a brand new series that you're putting on the In Grace television program starting this weekend. You'll be back with us next Tuesday on radio. We'll be talking about the, the radio feature there. But it's called The Quest to Rebuild the Jewish Temple. First of all, what intrigued you about doing this series? Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, some news story came out, and my dad told me and Julie, my sister, about it. They found the ashes of the red heifer. Mm. And man, we were like, oh, the rapture is about to happen. And we were so excited and so ready. And I don't know whatever happened with that story, but um, anything that had to do with the, the rebuilding of the temple, I was interested in. I started making trips to Israel myself. Now leading, uh, George will be there in two weeks, leading about 110, I think is our, our new uh, number. Um, and as we've been going, you know, I've noticed that the Temple Mount is the flashpoint even today. And, you know, people that have gone to Israel have seen the Temple Institute. They've been preparing things for years. Um, well, there's a new movement now, and it, it was uh, bringing these red heifers to Israel, uh, these live animals. We happened to know a person that knew a person, and I just had to ha happened to have a contact with the man that brought the red heifers to Israel. And he contacted me and invited us to follow along and kind of tell the story. Mm -hmm. So it, that, that led to me ending up in a cow pasture in Dallas. I'm um, like, what am I doing here, you know, Lord? And, and obviously, I think it was his guiding to tell the story. Uh, we were in Israel. We met rabbis that were part of this. We, we stood on a piece of property they had bought on the Mount of Olives for the ceremony. And that led to all these other really interesting things that had to do with the temple. So... It kind of morphed just from let's tell the story of the red heifers to let's talk about rebuilding the temple. Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say? As Christians, how do I feel about it? Now, I had mixed emotions. You know, so that's what the three part series is of launching uh, Saturday here in Milwaukee on TV 30 and across the nation. We're on TBN uh, on Wednesday nights. And YouTube now, Jim, and you know, streaming and everything, people all over the world can right. be watching right. this, this show right, right now. Right. So we're, we're hoping that um, people's interest in the quest to rebuild the Jewish temples, what the series is called, will compel them to watch, but then also every episode we do, we give the gospel. And so that's, that's all I really care about that's is I want people to hear the gospel. Yeah, that's really the heart of it. So yes, yeah, Sunday evenings at 8.30 p.m. right here on TV 30. We also stream that at vcy.tv. You can uh, and encourage people anywhere to tune in at vcy.tv, anywhere across the nation, around the world, but over the air here uh, as well. 
and uh, as the other uh, Apple TV, Roku, and all those other means. Um, we have a, just a brief video clip that kind of gives us an overview of this series. So we're, let's watch the video clip, and we'll have you comment further on it. This will be the tenth heifer, and they believe it'll be the one that'll usher the coming of Moshiach. So we're just in the Dome of the Rock. Now we're going to go into the Al Aqsa Mosque. We don't usually get access to go inside these buildings, so this is very special. So they have things like the menorah. They have things ready to go for rebuilding the temple. You actually have, that's a very fast overview of all this, but yeah. uh, you're getting into some locations that are not normally open to tourists, and I'd uh, like to hear a little bit of backstory to that, but also that the Temple Mount itself really has quite a history behind it. Um, you can't even imagine the history that that spot. I, it, there's something very unique to God about Jerusalem. And we don't know exactly if, if why exactly that is. The Jews have a tradition that that's the foundation stone. The, the rock below the Dome of the Rock uh, not only was where Abraham was willing to offer his only son, Isaac, but also maybe the, the beginning of creation started there. We don't know. Uh, the flood would have really changed geology, of course. But there's something very unique to that place, to God. It's that, in that very spot. So the Temple Mount's the, the center of the center of the center. Um, and when you go up there, you're thinking like mm -hmm. um, Abraham, Isaac. You're yeah. thinking uh, David, you know, taking over this, this city, the Jebusite city. And, and Abraham had paid tithes to Melchizedek from Salem, that, that same city. And then God did not allow David to build the temple, but they, David did buy the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. And that's the very spot, Okay. Then Solomon builds the temple. That gets destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. You know, and we read about all of this. You know, and you go through the history. So Rebel Bull, Nehemiah, everyone comes back. They build it again, but it's not as grand. Herod take it, takes it and expands it and embellishes. And then Jesus is there. Think of all the things that, yeah. as you're walking around the Temple Mount, it's like, wow, yeah. you know, so much history. And then it's, it's still the focal point of Bible prophecy, too, in the end times. So you have that deep history and you have that exciting eschatology, the future of that spot. I love going up on the Temple Mount and mm -hmm. we, every tour, we, we at least try to go up there and uh, show people. You actually ask a, a Temple Mount guide yeah. uh, up there about the location of Solomon's Temple in relationship to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the Dome of the Rock. He has some interesting things to say. We're going to play that clip and then have you comment on it. That is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Yes. And that is uh, the Dome of the Rock. No, 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 no. So, this is not Al-Aqsa Mosque. That is not. No, Al-Aqsa Mosque is the compound. The claim that the entire Temple Mount is Al-Aqsa, not just the building we were just in, is false. It's a new claim that doesn't line up with Islamic history. Some are saying this because they don't want the Jews to pray on the Temple Mount let alone rebuild their temple here. Our guide told me that as a good Muslim, he believes the Bible. So I asked him, since he believes the Bible, he must believe that the Jewish temple once stood here. I will not destroy my building for them to rebuild the temple. This is my country. I'm here now. Even if there is a temple before, I don't care. This is my building. This is my land now. I'm here now. And the problem that most of the powerful countries all around the earth are supporting, the terrorism, I mean, we are under occupation since 48. Our Temple Mount guide called Israel terrorist and occupiers? This is also not true. Israel has the legal claim to the land of Israel, and especially here on the Temple Mount. King David purchased the threshing floor from Aruna the Jebusite. And in 1947, the United Nations Partition Plan divided up what was known then as Mandatory Palestine, giving the Jews and Arabs land. The Jews accepted this, but the Arabs were not satisfied with the Jews having any land and attacked Israel numerous times with the goal of driving them into the sea. Every time the Arabs attacked Israel, 
they lost ground. Israel is not the occupier, nor the terrorist. They are the only democracy in the Middle East surrounded by monarchies and dictatorships. Israel, the only sanctuary for the Jewish people in our dangerous world, has the right to exist and also to defend itself. Now, I want to keep watching this program. <laughs> it's so interesting. And the viewers, just a reminder, this coming Sunday evening at 8.30, you can uh, catch the first episode. But I found his comments real interesting. I don't care if there was a temple here before. I'm here now. Yeah. That's all really that matters. So the narrative of the, the WAC, which is the organization, the religious organization that controls the Temple Mount, basically. I mean, Israel does, but they don't, you know. Uh, he was a representative of that. We tried to disguise his face and voice for obvious reasons. He told me when we were inside the Dome of the Rock that he, as a good Muslim, he believes the scriptures, the, the Bible. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to use that later. Because another narrative has been from that same group and others, like the Palestinians, uh, the leadership at least, and others, uh, that there was never a temple there. Now, we go through and answer that for people in the series, you know, because... Uh, we actually met the lady that um, discovered the pattern, uh, you know, the Temple Mount Sifting Project. They had taken all this stuff out. They built an underground mosque, and they dumped it, and the Jews went and collected it all and sifted it on Mount Scopus. And I actually did that once, and you can go there and sift. And they are finding all this evidence of the temple. They found um, tiles. And so the lady that found the cursed tablet from Mount Ebal, a whole other big story, archaeological story that we covered, she also was the one that fi figured out the geometry of Herod's temple, of the floor, by just getting all these random tiles and, and figuring it out. She said that that was uh, the thing she was most proud of, not the curse tablet discovery, which I was surprised. There's these old beams that um, date, we think date to the time of the first temple that were discarded. Uh, an another Jewish man uh, hid those away, and we were able to go and film those in a secret location. And a matter of fact, you, people will see that. Yeah. They won't see where on the map right. this is. We're, we don't want to tell people, and, and we've been told that now they're, they've been turned over to Israel, to the antiquities for, for study. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but either way, I got to, we, we, I was with an archeologist. We got to carry them outside. So did I touch mm. cedars of Lebanon, wow. you know, beams from uh, maybe Herod, maybe earlier, Temple. So we have all this evidence there was a temple, and we go through all of that. Even the Muslim guidebook um, of maybe 20, 30 years ago said this is where the temple stood. You know, so this new narrative, there was no, never a temple there. Um, and then I asked the guide, I just said, um, if you believe the Bible, it obviously talks about a temple. So I kind of cornered him, and then he said, well, even if it was there, you know, it's ours now, mm -hmm. right? So that's the flashpoint, Jim. If, if the Bible predicts a temple rebuilt in the time of at least the tribulation period, how could that be? Yeah. You know, because there's such a, a big problem, the Dome of the Rock. There are not lots of tourists that just have access to some of these areas that you were in. Not anymore. Okay. Yeah. They used to, we used to go on tours into the Dome of the Rock. I think it was the first intifada they stopped uh, non-Muslims from going in. It's another like God story where um, we were in Israel, we were filming with an archeologist that digs Shiloh. He had just been with Kevin Sorbo and they were doing a big project. Somehow they got to go in and he said, no, just call this guy and give him, I think it was $500, which is a lot of money, but to go into Al-Aqsa and Dome of the Rock and to do some uh, filming, um, I jumped at that opportunity. Yes. And then also to be able to interview um, the guide uh, to kind of hear their their narrative, I think, was very helpful mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. as Americans to understand what exactly the situation on the ground is. Indeed. Pastor Jim Scudder is with us here tonight on In Focus, and we're talking about a, a new series that is coming up on the In Grace television program. And, uh, friends, uh, by tuning in this Sunday evening, you'll catch the first episode of The Quest to Rebuild the Jewish Temple. Uh, airing at uh, 8.30 p.m. You see some alternate air times there as well. You can even set up your DVR to catch it so that you can make sure that you do uh, get that. We'll tell you a little bit later in the program how you can get a hard copy, a DVD copy of that as well uh, through their ministry. Uh, you saw something called the Cave of the Spirits and the Well of the Soul. What, what was that? Yeah, in the Dome of the Rock. And by the way, the Dome of the Rock is not a mosque. It's a shrine. Some people think it was actually a church at one time. Now it's 
obviously a Muslim structure. It actually has real gold as you as you stand and see it from all over Jerusalem, mm -hmm. especially the Mount of Olives. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful gold leaf uh, structure. Um, but below this foundation stone, it's the highest point underneath the dome, dome of the rock. So the rock, we believe, would have been the, the high point of Mount Moriah, and that's where um, Abraham mm -hmm. offered Isaac. Below that rock, it's actually hollow. I didn't know that, but there's a, a place you can go downstairs. He brought us down. We filmed that, and we tell about that a yeah. little bit in the story. You know, a, a lot of other questions. Where's the Ark of the Covenant? You right, know, and right, right. So we, we don't reveal that, mm -hmm. but uh, there are some ideas that I have of, of maybe where that is. Uh, you were talking about the ashes of the red heifer. We were referring to that earlier. First of all, before we show some footage from the upcoming series, what are the significance of the ashes of the red heifer? You said you were excited when you heard that. The rapture right. must be nearby. Yeah. So what's significant about those ashes? Uh, so, you know, in Numbers, God directs Moses to take a pure red heifer, around, I think it was two years old, never a yoke, no blemishes, and mm -hmm. uh, sacrifice it. Uh, basically, uh, a lot of the sacrifices in the temple were um, an animal sacrifice where some went to the priest, some went to God, and some went to the person. This red heifer all went to God. It was the whole animal was burnt, and they take the ashes of that animal and certain other things like of the wood, and they collect all of that and they they keep that, and then they would mix that in water and use that to purify people. For uh, originally it was the tabernacle worship, and now um, you know the time of the temple it was for the temple worship, and so there's been nine red heifers sacrificed over the centuries. Of course, there hasn't been one for uh, several thousand years now. They don't have any ashes today, so they need to sacrifice a pure red heifer. And that's where I'm we... I'm going to stop you there. What do you mean by pure red okay, heifer? Because so, we see lots of red heifers out there. Yeah, so the, uh, uh, this, from what I understand, okay, this cow uh, has to be pure red with no um, white hair, black hair, and they examine it. They're, they look very carefully. And then often, as these calves are born, they're all pure red, but then they develop, kind of like we do, uh, gray hair. And uh, so when they get to, to two, they're disqualified. So they've got five now in Israel that are pure. They weren't ear tagged. They always t ear tag these cows. And, and we'll play a clip of the kind of the miracle of that. Um, they, they do it when they're really little because they can catch them. Uh, once they're bigger, it's harder, so the, all the ranchers ear tag them right away, and then they're disqualified. So as the, these, some of these Christians were trying to help the, their Jewish friends uh, to be able to rebuild the temple, they need, this, they need these red heifer uh, ashes in order to move forward with it. Now, I think the sacrifice could happen before the, the temple is built. Uh, I don't know the timing of it, but there's five red heifers in Israel today mm. And if and I think it's about nine months or so, there'll be two, and they'll re-examine them. And and I think they would probably go ahead and do the ceremony now, even if the temple is not built, uh, and then have have the ashes for that time. Wow, wow. Well, you met up with a rancher mm -hmm. uh, for red heifers, and uh, let's air the clip. We'll have you comment on that clip. Before the temple can be used, a very special ceremony must take place first. And that brings us back to the red heifers. Okay, so you have the heifers being born, but you have pretty quickly a problem. And that is you ranchers tag the ear That's of right. these calves. We had uh, already tagged all the calves. And so when Robert came, I said, you know, he said, they can't, have a, they can't have an ear tag. And I said, well, I've got, you know, a couple hundred out there, but they all have ear tags. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be able to help you. And so we said, well, let's, let's drive around and look anyways. And we did. And as we were driving around, we came back and we hadn't found anything. And my brother and, and the rabbis and I, we said a little prayer and said, well, let's, let's go one more time. And, and about that time, this mama cow or this baby calf came walking out of the woods. Oh, no kidding. And we hadn't tagged it yet. So uh, so we were all excited, and they went over and looked at it and said, said this one's solid red. And, and these two rabbis went to examining this calf, and all of a sudden they go to crying, and then they get all excited, and they get on the telephone, and 
I'm hearing all this Hebrew. I don't know what they're <laughs> saying, but they, I can tell they're excited. To bring this red heifer and four others into Israel, many bureaucratic, logistic, and financial hurdles had to be overcome. After months of effort, five red heifers landed at Ben Gurion Airport in Israel to much joy and celebration. The song they are singing is about the Holy Temple. We're going to pause it right there. I mean, it's uh, very intriguing to see this unfold, Texas, now to being in Israel. Yeah, so they've landed, they're in Israel, they're uh, being tended to, I think in an undisclosed location, which is kind of funny, like you have to you know, hide the location of cows. But uh, it's important for the Jewish people uh, that they can you know, have this ceremony. Uh, there are many people that don't want any of this, obviously. Uh, there's probably secular Jews that don't want it. There's, of course, all the, the Muslims that don't want it. So it's a sen really sensitive topic. It was really interesting to interview Ty, his name is the rancher, and they raise uh, Red Angus cows, and uh, I'm sure he never thought in his wildest dreams he would be sending one to Israel for possibly the, uh, the rebuilding of the temple. But um, this, his story was intriguing, compelling. You know, they drove around, couldn't find anything, and, and then they uh, prayed, and they went back out, and a mom comes out with a, a calf that hadn't been ear-tagged. Uh, and then four others from, I think, a different ranch were found, and they all went to Israel. Now, the hurdles for this, Jim, from my understanding, they had to pass USDA approval. They had to, of course, Israel had to, I mean, whenever you move livestock, because they're worried about diseases spreading mm -hmm. from country to country, they're really, really careful. And then you have to, you know, pay for this. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars to fly these cows. Right. Because oh, yeah. they have to be in a certain freight uh, airplane that's heated and stuff like that. Um, they have to be tended. Uh, there was a fuel stop. They had to get permission of that country where the fuel stop was. You know, it's very complicated. And then they couldn't ship these cows. Almost all animals that have, you know, these transits into countries are chipped uh, and quarantined. And they're, they're looking for any diseases, too. They couldn't ship them because that could be a blemish, too. Mm -hmm. So they had to be creative in the way that they handle all of this. But they got it done, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and there they are today, uh, um, seen in a few months if they'll pass the scrutiny of the rabbis. Very interesting. Now, the location of where these animals would be sacrificed is also critically important. Right. So there is a, a place that, from, from what the rabbis told me, I, I'm not sure if I can find it in Scripture. I know the ceremony took place on the Mount of Olives. They said that it had to be line of sight and the elevation of the door of the temple. So you could stand in the temple and look out the door of the holy place and see the spot where the sacrifice or the ceremony would take place. So that means it couldn't be lower on the Mount of Olives. That's the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed. Or at the top, it'd have to be somewhere more in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then it would also have to be somewhere that would have that right um, angle from the temple door too. Uh, now, Mount of Olives is a, an Arab area in Jerusalem. Um, of course, there's a lot of se Jewish cemeteries, but they don't, that's all that Jewish people have are the cemeteries. The top and, and the hillsides are all either church owned, Garden of Gethsemane, or owned by um, uh, Arabs. And the Arabs obviously wouldn't knowingly sell land to Jewish people. Well, the Jewish people are very good at acquiring property, and they were able to acquire property there, a parcel that's probably like a quarter acre. Um, and we stood there and we filmed um, mm -hmm. at that location with some of the rabbis that are involved in all of this. Uh, to stand there in the place where this is going to happen is uh, unbelievable. And I also got to share the gospel Tremendous. for one of our shows at that property. Let's go take a look at that video clip. Rabbi Saki Mamo was part of the group responsible for bringing the Texas red heifers to Israel. As we stood on the property on the Mount of Olives that had been bought for the red heifer ceremony, I wanted to know what the rebuilding of the temple meant to him. We are in time of redemption. And part of the redemption is to build new building, to build new train, to build new uh, autonomic car. 
But the second level is to build the spirituality. You know, when I was a kid, I don't remember that we talk about the Temple Mount. Today, my grandson, he's four years old. If you will talk with him, I don't want to say every two sentences, but you know, he's talking about the temple. Wow. Is that, is that common with, with Jewish children? Yeah, these yeah, days? yeah, yeah. Wow. And this is part of the change. Hmm. Friends, you want to see more? Tune in this Sunday evening, 8.30 p.m. here on Channel 30. Pastor Jim, very intriguing, this, this location. Right, so the spot is critical, and that they've acquired it is, is really interesting to me. Um, you heard him talking about how different it is now regarding, like, the national uh, psyche about this temple, mm -hmm. where it used to be maybe 10, 20 years ago, you would be considered an extremist if you thought that there should be a temple built on the Temple Mount. He said today there are people in Knesset, a number of people in Knesset, that hold the view that they want to rebuild the temple. Um, it used to be, you know, very few people thought Jewish people should be able to pray in the Temple Mount. Today, almost all of Israel says they should be able to pray in the Temple mm -hmm. Mount. I mean, mm -hmm. at the very least, Shouldn't they be able to pray on the Temple Mount? But they are not allowed to today. Now, with, with Prime Minister Netanyahu being reelected, um, I've been reading his book, and I'm very impressed uh, with where he's at with all of this. You know, I think he, he really does believe that uh, West Bank, Judea, Samaria should be uh, theirs. And that I, I really believe that deep down, he believes the Temple probably should be there. Mm. Now, I doubt he'll ever say that, because that's a huge flashpoint. Many people have said, if you, if you even discuss this, it's World War III, right? But now more and more and more people in Israel are longing for this, discussing this, and it's becoming much more mainstream than it used to be. Very interesting. We're going to cover a couple more issues. There's so much we could go on for hours, even as your series uh, unfolds so much of this. But uh, the instruments of worship as well uh, you bring about in this series Again, the quest to rebuild the Jewish temple. And you actually uh, had a, a meeting with some harp makers. <laughs> Imagine uh, the, the different roads that when you're starting to do interviews and, and tell the story, uh, we don't, I, I don't sit down and plan, I'm not that smart to plan it all out. It, it just kind of happens. And I say, Lord, thank you, mm -hmm. you know, that he gives us these avenues. Uh, so, Years and years ago, when I was pretty young, my, my dad buys my mom a harp from Israel and some people in our church. Somehow they came across the store and they were making harps and selling harps. And when I was starting to film this series, I remembered that. And then somebody says, you should go interview the harp makers, the Hararis, uh, for this temple series. I said, yeah, I remember them. And they, my mom has a harp in her house uh, from them. And... Um, and then they said, well, well, they had a tragedy. They had a fire that uh, they had this big workshop and they were building all these harps. And it was one of those arson fires that they've been setting in Israel. They'll like send up a balloon that's got oh, yeah. uh, a flame on it. And it came down and sadly in a uh, forest of trees planted to commemorate Holocaust survivors mm. or Holocaust victims. And so the whole forest of Holocaust victims uh, was burnt down and it took, uh, it took their shop and it al almost took their lives. Uh, they survived, um, I think, by God's grace, but their, their shop did not. But they had been making these harps, uh, and, and a lot of them had already gone to the Temple Institute. The, I think the very first thing that the Temple Institute bought when they first were developing this organization that wants to rebuild the Temple was one of their harps. Mm. And now they have a number of harps. If you go through their, their newer museum there in the old city of Jerusalem, the Jewish Quarter, you'll actually see a mannequin of uh, the man that's the harp builder, Mika uh, uh, Harari. So we, while we were in Israel, I said, you know, I'll, I'll take a chance and, and try to contact them. I made an email. Uh, she got right back to me. And I said, well, we have like, we only had like a half a day. We're filming last uh, summer. And I said, is there any chance I could come out and get an interview? And she said, you know what? We have like two hours right now. We're like, okay, we're coming. <laughs> So we sat down, had the most wonderful couple hours with them, just sweetest people. And 
they were also talking about how God drew them back to Israel. They mm -hmm. lived in the United States. They were looking for peace and happiness, kind of hippies, you know, and they lived in all these beautiful places, and they were just drawn to Israel. He said like a cable was attached to them and bringing them to Israel. And I've heard Jewish people tell me this before. Why did you go make Aliyah? Why did you go to, back to Israel? Well, we just felt compelled, mm -hmm. right? And God predicted this, that God would draw, like first disperse them because of, the, of their unbelief, but then bring them back uh, for a time. I believe that there, the time is, uh, unfortunately, for the tribulation period, but I even in the tribulation, they're going to find Yeshua as a nation and believe in him. Uh, they're going to have to go through some terrible stuff. You know, they went through the Holocaust. They've gone through awful, awful things in the past. They're going to go through Holocaust too, I believe, in the tribulation period. But, um, you know, even in the tribulation, we see God's grace. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, you've got a video clip from the series as well we'd like to share with uh, the viewers. Let's watch that right now and learn about the heart makers. Mika and Shoshone Harari are making authentic biblical harps in Israel for the first time in thousands of years. Sadly, their harp workshop recently burned down due to wildfires set by arsonists. But they still had a hopeful outlook and were excited about being part of something miraculous. Many of their harps are now ready to be played in the third temple. In the prophets, there's a few of them that repeat this and it says, in those days, I will call my children from the four corners of the earth, from the east and the west and the north and the south, and I will bring them back to their own land and I will replant them and they will never be uprooted again. Hmm. It's like we who were wandering through the land of our own birth, like we were born in America, and we were looking for our perfect place. We couldn't be satisfied, like our feet. We went to the most beautiful places that exist, maybe in the world. Mm -hmm. We weren't satisfied. We didn't feel at home. And it said, I'll bring you back. We didn't have a choice. <laughs> it was at a certain point, it felt like something was like a cable was connected to us. And it just drew us here. It's got to be something holy and, you know, prophetic and end of days to have brought us to the land at the end of days. And everything else that happened, we, we knew. But, it, you know, after we'd been here a little while, we knew that there was something very important going on and that we were sent here to bring the heart back. Very, very interesting. <laughs> um, Pastor Jim, uh, we've got one more clip we want to show here tonight as well. And uh, you actually came across a, another farmer that was growing herbs. And and uh, Tell us about that encounter, what happened there, and what was the, what's the purpose behind these? Yeah, so we were, again, looking for any other connections to the temple and people that were involved in doing something for the temple. And, of course, the temple had anointing oil and incense, mm -hmm. and that's a big part of it. So we got wind of this gentleman. His name is Guy Ehrlich, and he's down near Jericho. He has a farm called the Balm of Gilead Farm. Wow. And he said that all of these ancient plants hadn't been grown in Israel like frankincense and myrrh and the Balm of Gilead for uh, centuries. And so he just felt like this was his calling on life was to start growing these. So he would go collect almost like his children, you know, go all over the world and collect these little specimens and plant them and grow them. And uh, we went out there and it, it, he, again, he was just saying, I, I feel like God wanted me to get involved in making the, the incense for the temple. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's actually been approved by one of the rabbis that what he is doing, what he is growing, and uh, it's going to be used for the, for the third temple. Uh, I never expected to be, so he wanted me to like grind the resin and you know he would put it on these coals and the incense comes up. I never expected to be doing stuff like that, but there I was, and to tell the story, uh, all connecting to the, the temple, it was really, really fun, really amazing. Let's watch that final video clip here for tonight. Another person in Israel that is doing something that hasn't been done for 2,000 years is Guy Ehrlich. He's growing the Balm of Gilead and other ancient plants and trees near Jericho. These will likely be used as the incense 
in the third temple. I'm going to light a, a coal. Yes. The chopped resin, after you chop it well, called in Hebrew, mugmar. Mugmar. Okay, let me take uh, some of it. Okay, you can continue. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to take the mugmar. This is the mugmar. Okay, so you have a, a hot coal. A coal. And I want to bless you, you and your audience, with good okay. health and the happiness and the prosperity and fulfillment and a lot of good to you, to your families and to the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, the way to enjoy the, the smell is uh, wow. to stand against the wind or to grab it to yourself with the ends. That's strong. Yeah. Wow. Okay, friends, again, uh, this Sunday evening at uh, 8.30 uh, in the evening central time, you can catch the quest to rebuild the Jewish temple and uh, other times throughout the course of the week as well. Uh, very interesting uh, to, to meet this individual, and these may be the plants that actually use the incense that will be used in that third temple. Yeah, and that also gave me an understanding of how they make incense, you know. Mm -hmm. So he would just uh, cut one of the branches, it would start to weep its, uh, what do you call it, resin, and uh, they would, it would get hard, so it would like um, try to heal itself. They'd break mm -hmm. that resin off, and they called it like a teardrop or something like that, and they put it in that, that thing, and you crush it, and then they put it onto the coals. So this is very much part of what was happening in the tabernacle, mm -hmm. what's happening in the temple. And it actually represents prayer, right? The incense going up to God, and, and, and that's in the New Testament in our day, that's what God wants us to do. Our lives should be incense, the way that we live, but also that we speak to the Lord uh, continually, that we're in a constant state mm -hmm. of prayer. So all these connections to the temple, and again, the temple is um, not in operation today. We don't need the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I felt like I didn't want to promote Christians um, giving like money toward building the temple because I feel like the, like Jesus made that final sacrifice. You know, it is finished, and the veil of the temple was torn at that moment too when he died, and uh, Jesus predicted the temple would be destroyed. Sure enough, 70 A.D. A few years later, it was. And then also in Matthew 24, he says it's going to, the, the Antichrist is going to desecrate the mm -hmm. temple. So we know it was an Antichus Epiphanes, the Greek um, gentleman that d did desecrate the temple. It's a future wicked man like Antichus Epiphanes, we call the Antichrist, halfway through the tri tribulation period. In uh, Revelation, God tells John not to measure the outer court of the temple. Um, I believe that probably means that Al Aqsa will stand, the Dome of the Rock will move and maybe some sort of a final wow. peace treaty. Wow, very interesting. The series is going to air on WBCY Channel 30 over the next three weeks, uh, but you also have a, available this on a DVD that but viewers can get, send it to their friends around the country as well. How can that be obtained? Uh, it's still in production. It will. It's available right now to pre-purchase um, on the website. I think it's any donation to In Grace uh, on our website, ingrace.tv, or... Um, our phone number is 1-800-78-GRACE, and our address is in Grace P.O. Box 9, Lake Zurich, Illinois, 60047. It's on the screen, so everyone can uh, jot that down. You can also get digital download, and some, some people like to do it that way. But whatever we air on TV is a lot shorter than we actually put in these DVDs. Mm -hmm. uh, the DVD, was generally each show is around 40 minutes. Um, on TV were probably about 25 minutes is the most you're going to see. So if you want to see like expanded interviews with the Heartmakers and, and Guy with the Balm of Gilead and all of that, um, I think the DVD is the yeah. way to go. Again, friends, you can reach out to them at 1-800-78-GRACE, 1-800-78-GRACE, or going to ingrace.tv, and you'll find more information on the series. Friends, we'd like to open our phone lines here tonight. Maybe something that uh, Pastor Jim has said has uh, sparked a question in your mind. If you have a brief comment to make, our phone lines are open right now. Time is short, though, so we encourage you to respond immediately at 414-935-3030, 414-935-3030. Nine three five thirty thirty. Toll free, you may reach us one eight hundred seven three three eighty eight thirty. That's one eight hundred 
733-8830. Were you intrigued by watching this tonight and some of this matter unfold, uh, the issue of the rebuilding of the Jewish temple? Uh, also, uh, to, if you'd like to text in your question or your brief comment, you can use our text line, which is 414-439-3585. That's 414-439-3585. Pastor Jim White is all this matter. Well, the Bible predicts these things. Uh, the Bible, you know, Jesus says that the Antichrist will desecrate uh, the temple. Uh, after he says it will be destroyed. So it's destroyed. And you know what's interesting is Titus told his army to not destroy the temple. Destroy Jerusalem, leave the temple. I think he wanted to desecrate it. Hmm. But they disobeyed. I'm surprised. I mean, you disobey a Roman general who would become Caesar. But they did because they were so angry with the Jewish people and they destroyed it. So he didn't desecrate it. That means that there's a future man that will. Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about the Antichrist setting himself up as God, desecrating the temple. Daniel 9 mm -hmm. talks about the Antichrist desecrating a temple. So, so all of this is fulfillment of prophecy. Why does it matter? Because the Bible, when it predicts something, it's going to happen. So to me, uh, as a Bible believer, I, I see all the promises of God, and there's a lot of promises to us today. He won't ever leave us, forsake us. He'll give us eternal life if we'll simply believe in Him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Jesus. Uh, Jesus died for our sins and rose again. So all of these promises are there. Well, He's promised other things that are going to happen. So I believe it's going to happen. I think we're close to these times. I think after doing this series, I'm like, we are really close, yeah, you know, yeah. closer than we, I know for sure we're closer today than we were yesterday, Jim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we know Jesus is coming back. He promised he's coming back. Uh, there is a tribulation period coming on the, upon this world. Uh, people are calling for peace. There's no peace. There's war and rumors of war, Ukraine right. and everything else. And it's only going to get worse. Uh, there is hope. And there's that Prince of Peace that's going to come. Ultimately, at the end of the tribulation period, put all the rebellion and sin down and set up his kingdom. And I'm going to be part of that. You're going to be part of that. And I hope that you're going to be part of that if you've trusted in Jesus as your only Savior. We are told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we know there's a, a, a seven-year peace treaty, too, from Daniel. Uh, and, and, and so as I see these peace accords happening, and I'm excited. I mean, the Abraham Accords are, are a miracle that these things are happening. But um, ultimately, there's going to be no peace you know, until mm -hmm. Jesus comes back. Right. But we are supposed to pray in Psalm, it says, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We had better do that. Uh, yesterday in our Israel day, I laid out five things you can do to stand with Israel. One mm -hmm. is stand with Israel, stand up for Israel. Social media, if you ever hear any anti-Semitic stuff, stand up for Israel. Kanye West, whatever, whoever says the anti-Semitic stuff, stand up against that. Go to Israel. That's a big one. If you can go, save your shekels. Uh, go to Israel. And then uh, give uh, to support causes in Israel that would be a, a blessing to um, Jewish people and also maybe share with them that cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then uh, pray. Pray for Israel. Those five things. So important. Friends, tonight we have some open phone lines. You can talk with Pastor Jim Scudder, 414-935-3030. Toll free, 800-733-8830. Or you can text in your question or comment, 414-439-3585. The series does begin this coming Lord's Day on VCY at 8.30 p.m. and has some additional airings as well. Thursdays at 11.30 a.m. Also Fridays at 6.30 a.m. Overnight Saturdays at 3.30 a.m. that the In Grace uh, television program can be watched. You mentioned earlier in our interview about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, does anybody come out and say, we know where it is? Okay, so, yes, in the Temple Institute, and again, that's the organization that was set up. There was a soldier that was part of capturing the Temple Mount in 1967. And the famous, we have the Temple Mount was broadcast. We actually hit play a clip of that in this series. He went and um, started this organization to reveal the Temple. And actually, a, a Muslim guide that next of oh, that day that they captured the Temple Mount showed them all around and said, this is where the temple was and all that. And they said, why are you doing this? He says, well, we have a tradition that says you're going to one day rebuild your temple. 
and we assume you're starting today hmm. or tomorrow. And they didn't. They gave it back, which is uh, so odd. Again, it's not, it wasn't God's timing. It's, it's coming down the road. I think it's soon. Uh, but there's that yearning, and he's been working on this, building this. So at the very end of the tour, they have this curtain that opens, and there's a Ark of the Covenant, a replica. And they say uh, on, the, on the speakers, um, the, the Ark of the Covenant has been found, and we have it, uh, and when we need it, we will get it. You know? mm-hmm. I don't know if they do or don't, but there's, we did a whole series on the Copper Scroll, and people can go back on our YouTube channel and, and watch what others believe that it could be hidden away by Jeremiah in the caves of Qumran. Uh, it's kind of what I'm hoping for, that, that our, our series uh, actually does come true there. But I know also that they didn't have the, the Ark of the Covenant in the second temple, at least in Herod's time. I think they had already hidden it away. And, and the Shekinah glory wasn't there either, the, mm. the pillar of, of light. And actually, you know, the Shekinah glory left, the, when you read about it, um, one of these rabbis told me this, and I couldn't, I, I, for some reason, I hadn't connected it in the Bible. It went, um, when, when Nebuchadnezzar was going to come, and they were sinning, and God says, I'm going to, you're going to be punished, you know, for this. And they didn't do what Jeremiah said. So the Shekinah glory went up, I think it went over the city of David, and then went up to the Mount of Olives, and mm-hmm. it ascended from the Mount of Olives. And I'm like, that's where Jesus ascended, and he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. The Shekinah glory is Jesus, the light of the world right? Yes. So, I don't know, all of these things connect so amazingly, and uh, will the Ark of the Covenant be found? You know, everyone's excited about that, you know, Indiana Jones and all of that stuff. Um, I know that, again, I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. Um, Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. Mm-hmm. All, everything pointed to Jesus. My feeling is they'll find it, and maybe that will lead toward uh, rebuilding the temple. I don't know. I don't have any inside information. Uh, I wish I, I wish I, sure. maybe that's another uh, series that we'll do yeah, one yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll come forth at one time. Yeah. Uh, let me, uh, here's a, a, a text from Sandy in Milwaukee. Does the Abrahamic house of mosque, church, and synagogue have any part of these last day times events? I believe in Abu Dhabi is where right. this is being built. I don't know. I mean, I know that that's one big component of the tribulation period will be a one world religion, mm-hmm. and that certainly would tie into that. Uh, it seems like every religion is okay as long as you don't say yours is the only one. Well, un- I'm not going to say unfortunately, but our religion is the only one, and I wouldn't even call it a religion. Christianity is God reaching down to us, and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I don't get involved in ecumenism. And all these religions coming together, they say we all worship the same God. That's not true. Mm-hmm. There's one God, the God of the Bible. Jesus is the Son of God. And so, I don't know. I, I, I think it does have some tie-in with the way the whole world will come together under one religious leader. And then that religious leader will be kicked out because the Antichrist wants worship. Some of the unholy trinity. Yes, yeah. that's right. Let's go to uh, Kelly, who is calling in from Mayville. Hi, Kelly. You're on the air. I just was wondering if you ever heard of, you say in end times during the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to be assigned a certain number, 666. Well, it, there's a code called A6 English Gematria, and that's how it it starts with A and goes to Z, and it goes from 6 and uh, the number six, and it goes all the way up till Z, till progresses by six points each letter. And have you ever heard of that? And if it's if so, um, I. Uh, okay, okay, we're going to have him just address this issue of six six six, and I don't know it can go down many many different aspects of this. Yeah, so six 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 is a number the Bible talks about, the mark mm-hmm. of the beast. It's it's more than just a number though. It's actually a mark. You know, some people are afraid of a, a chip. Um, and, and I guess I would be too, especially if they said it's going to be in your right hand or forehead. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, the, it's the number of man, mm-hmm. you know, 666. Um, so we don't know, and a lot of people try to figure it out with um, numbers and names. And they, but the problem with all that, Jim, is if you look back in the last 20, 30, 40 years, a lot of names have come up 
Gorbachev, Kissinger, whoever. Ronald Wilson Reagan, because there you each go. <laughs> name had six letters. So in it. the problem with that is it's it's not clear in scripture. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful. I think we could spend way too much time on that kind of stuff, yeah. and then we're not giving the gospel. One other question here. This is from Kirk in Oak Creek. Will there be animal sacrifices during the millennial reign? Is a temple where this will take place? So there is going to be a third temple. I would call it the tribulation temple. For sure, it will be fully built and operating halfway through the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Can we see it in our lifetime before the rapture? Possibly. You know, we don't know. There will be sacrifices in that um, temple because the Antichrist stops the sacrifice. Then there is an actual fourth temple, mm -hmm. Ezekiel's temple, the millennial temple. And some people wonder, why would there be a temple if Jesus made the final sacrifice? You know, some people say it's a memorial, and certainly it will be a memorial, a way for us to remember what he did. But I also wonder if it could be for those that are children of mortals that are saved at the end of the tribulation. Mm. Children will be born. They'll have to believe. Some will not because we know there's a final rebellion at the end of the thousand-year reign. Could it be for them to have a right relationship, not salvation, but a right relationship with, with the Lord uh, mm -hmm. during the, the millennium? That's kind of where I feel that that's going to happen. I think there might be um, animal sacrifices. I'm not sure. I know there will be a, a beautiful temple. Mm -hmm. And on our, um, on our series, we actually have uh, computer renderings, animations of what that Ezekiel temple uh, would have looked like. Uh, possible. Well, friends, in just a moment, we'll provide you some contact information. But before we do that, we've got only a minute left, Pastor Jim. Mm -hmm. You talked about a time of great trial and testing tribulation that's coming for those who don't know Christ as Savior how can that be remedied for them it's a really simple uh, message it's uh, the message of why uh, Jesus came you know Genesis is God created everything was good and we sinned we rebelled and death passed upon all men God loved the world so much that he said oh, there's only one solution I'm gonna send my son he's gonna be a man he's gonna be perfect he's gonna die for man's sin and rise again and Jesus said, if you will trust in me, believe in me, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. If you'll trust in Jesus, you'll be saved today, tomorrow, and forever, and you won't have to face that tribulation period. Amen. Amen. Pastor Jim, thanks for being with us tonight. It's an honor, Jim. Thank you. And uh, Pastor Scudder will be with us also on radio next week, Tuesday, talking more about this. But friends, you can reach out to the In Grace Ministry. Again, it is uh, 1-800-78-GRACE. 1-800-78-GRACE, or go to ingrace.tv. But by all means, tune in this Sunday evening, 8.30 p.m., to catch this special. Our time is gone. Thanks for joining us here tonight on In Focus. Good night.